So I'm really honoured to be uh, to be here today. My name is Kirsty Bogan. I'm Executive Director of Energy for Humanity, we're a new environmental NGO. Now our focus is on two of the great environmental humanitarian challenges that we face in this century. How to dramatically cut carbon emissions to avoid catastrophic climate change in our own lifetimes and that of our children. And then secondly, lifting billions of people out of poverty to achieve the quality of life that we all take for granted. So both of these challenges have one thing in common, the energy that we use to power our world. Look, so many years ago I was protesting against nuclear power at the shore of nuclear power plant on Long Island and I was arrested for protesting nuclear power. And at that time, I, I thought, oh, if we had bioenergy and some wind and solar, that that would uh, be enough to solve the problem. And I've come now to see that the magnitude of the problem is so great that we can't afford to leave technologies uh, un unused that could potentially help. There's really only one technology that I know of that can provide carbon-free power when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing at the scale that modern civilization requires, and that's nuclear power. And whatever you think of nuclear power, we need to let it compete on its own merits, uh, given an appropriate regulatory environment and, and a sensible, uh, you know, cost-competitive uh, market situation, and we, we shouldn't discriminate against individual technologies. Uh, and the last point is that uh, it's not about either or. We're not talking about do we, are, do we favor solar power, wind, or nuclear power. I, I'm in favor of anything that can prevent climate change and preserve the environment and allow poor people to get food and health care and education. And, and, and so, uh, I guess the basic plea here is let's push these other agendas about, um, oh, you know, let's, let's, let's focus on the climate agenda. And the climate agenda is about supplying energy in a way that does not damage our environment. And we need to allow technologies to compete on their own merits. I've worked in all four of us, have devoted substantial fractions of our professional lives to understanding the fundamental physics, chemistry, biology, climate system. And we got into it because we want to understand it. We, don't, we didn't have any ulterior baggage there. But that study of the climate system has very strongly led us to the conclusion that we are incurring unacceptable risk for a future generation. I think that's why we're all here. Solve the problem. Now, as uh, Ken properly said, there are a lot of people who see this as an opportunity to advance one agenda or another. Okay, I think we have to be conscious of that. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But why are four climate scientists who don't have strong backgrounds in nuclear physics here talking to you today about nuclear energy. It's because we're scientists and we can do the math, right? If we want, if we truly are sincere about solving this problem, unless a miracle occurs, we are going to have to ramp up nuclear energy very fast. That's the reality. That's not my ideology. I don't care whether it's nuclear, like, uh, my, my friend Ken said, we don't care whether it's nuclear or solar or hydro, whatever combination works. The numbers don't add up unless you put nuclear power in the middle. No, we're not promoting nuclear energy, we're pr promoting a level playing field. We're asking everybody to make sure that because this is such a demanding, challenging problem, that we can't close the door to any type of technology. We have to give a fair and balanced assessment uh, eschewing ideology and preconceptions to decide on what the energy strategy should be for the future. You know, I like to emphasize the climate impacts that are irreversible. Uh, we are at a point now where it's extremely dangerous. We are at the point where if the planet gets much warmer, we are going to get uh, 
instability of ice sheets and sea level rise of at least several meters. And the consequences of that are almost incalculable. Half of the large cities in the world are on most fronts. The other thing that's irreversible uh, is extermination of species. If we stay on business as usual, IPCC estimates that by the end of the century, we could commit a quarter to a half of the species on the planet to extinction. The decisions we make in the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years will determine what's possible after 2030. So this initial period, ratifying the INDCs, uh, making sure that we don't just look for, uh, a, say, a renewable energy target, we, but we look for a clean energy target future. Um, I mean, that, that, that's the primary concern of this particular meeting. We know that using fossil fuels is not safe. It is very dangerous. And we have to face the fact that this danger of fossil fuels is staring us in the face. It's absolutely 100% certain that we've got a very dangerous situation. And for us to say, oh, we're not going to use all the tools that we have to try to solve it is crazy. We have to, uh, we have to use all of the uh, things that, that we have at our disposal. And clearly, nuclear power, next generation nuclear power especially, has tremendous potential to be a big part of the solution. This country that we're in, went from uh, almost no nuclear power to 80% electricity in something like 15 years. What else, are, what are our other options? We can scale up solar and wind pretty quickly up to a certain limit, and then we run headlong into the barriers dictated by intermittency. And we should do that. I don't think anybody on this, in this group of four scientists are opposed to doing that. Uh, but we have to understand the limitations. When you build a new power plant, there's no intention of closing that down. And what the science says is we've got to phase off of fossil fuels. We shouldn't be building new fossil fuel power plants. It, it doesn't make sense. It's not consistent with what the science is telling us. Science is about establishing facts, but because we're human beings who care about other people and we care about the environment, those facts speak to us and tell us as humans what we need to be doing. And I think all of us here feel that carbon dioxide emissions are dangerous and that, that there's no emission that's acceptable, that we need to be stopping all carbon dioxide emissions. China and India are using tremendous amounts of power, almost all coal, for their electric plants. And there's no way that they can power their steel mills and all the other factories that they're building products for us on solar panels. You know, it's and they know that. The governments of China and India know that. They want modern, better, safer nuclear technology. And for the West not to help them is immoral because we burned their share of the carbon budget. Now, they're stuck. Either they, they want to get wealthy, they want to raise people out of poverty, they need energy to do that. You can't do it without energy. And uh, so, if they don't have an alternative, they're gonna burn coal. And we should be helping them to find a clean alternative. If you, but if you look at Sweden, for example, they have Carbon-free electricity, that's the solution to the climate problem. If we have carbon-free electricity in all countries, we've solved the problem. Because we can make uh, uh, liquid fuels for transportation from energy if you have abundant uh, carbon-free electricity. And the way Sweden did it was in uh, 10 years to build uh, nuclear power plants and combine that with hydropower. So renewable energy plus nuclear energy provided provides them uh, carbon-free electricity. And that's what we need. 